And I'd love to think that if we had a more wonder prone society, we would meet each other with greater tolerance, with more openness, with more curiosity, with more empathy, and that it would create a more tolerant world. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Unlikely Collaborators. Their mission is to untangle the stories that hold us back as individuals, communities, nations, and humanity at large. Using the Perception Box lens, they do this through storytelling, experiences, impact, investments, and scientific research. Unlikely Collaborators, the only way forward is inward. Later on in this episode, I'll talk a lot more about the Perception Box and how it relates to this episode. But right now, let me tell you about today's guest. Today we welcome Monica Parker to the show. Monica is the founder of global human analytics and change consultancy Hatch, whose clients include blue chip companies such as LinkedIn, Google, Prudential, and Lego. Her career has been nothing short of colorful, having been an opera singer, a museum exhibition designer, a policy director, a chamber of commerce CEO, and a homicide investigator. She's also a world-renowned speaker, writer, and the author of the book, The Power of Wonder. In this episode, I talked to Monica Parker about the power of wonder. In today's fast-paced world, most people fail to notice the richness of life. To become more wonder-prone, Monica encourages us all to slow down and pursue meaningful exploration. When we pay more attention to the world, we become more empathetic, resilient, and exuberant. Monica shares with us her cycles of wonder framework and how we can be more open and present in our daily lives. We also touch on the topics of personality, post-traumatic growth, mindfulness, and education. I really enjoy chatting with Monica about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And we also geek out about other things that are also near and dear to my heart, such as the importance of mind wandering and productive daydreaming, for instance. I really appreciate Monica and her deep dive into the science and her appreciation of wonder in this world. So without further ado, I bring you Monica Parker. Monica Parker, welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here. Yeah, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. Uh, You wrote this book called The Power of Wonder, the extraordinary emotion that will change the way you live, learn, and lead. Uh, You have an interesting background. You know, I usually have uh, scientists on my podcast, (laughs) but I I wanted to have you on the show. Uh, You have such a fascinating life and uh, perspective on the topic of wonder. Uh, You, correct me if I'm wrong, but were you a homicide investigator? I was. Yeah, I was a homicide investigator for the Department of Justice in Florida, but I worked with the defense teams to try to get people off death row. Okay. And then like, what, what followed that career? What was uh, journalism? Was that immediately after? No. So from there, I went on to um, to running nonprofits for quite a while and working with children with disabilities. And then from that point, I went and got my master's degree in organizational behavior and then started my company called Hatch. So I like to think of myself as an applied scientist. Yeah, nice, nice. I like that. And well, maybe a lot of people uh, in the health professions, helping professions are applied scientists. Okay, well, when did you start to become interested in the topic of wonder? Did you did you have did you experience the feeling of wonder at all when you were a homicide investigator? I want to pick up that thread a little bit for a second. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. I think that I started to investigate wonder because I in my work as a change manager, I wanted to help people be more resilient and change. And as I started to research, I found that there was a red line going all the way back to the work that I did as a homicide investigator, which is that some people who have such grim futures and have had terrible pasts, just certain people are able to be more resilient, more buoyant. And what I discovered really looking at it is that people who held their world with a great deal of wonder were just better able to deal with what life threw at them. And so it's really picking this up about five years ago and tracking back to the work that I've been doing to see that there's this connectivity of wonder all the way through it. Yeah, I think there's sort of like a a taboo against having wonder for things that socially you're supposed to have disgust for. And I think that's a problem (laughs) that, you know, that you can be like shunned, socially shunned for having wonder, you know, like. You know, there are a lot of situations right now in, in America, if, 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 if someone doesn't agree with someone, they want to punch them in the face. But <laughs> I, I, t- I like to just have wonder, you know, I like to just lean into that. Is that bad? Does that make me a bad person that I want to have wonder <laughs> for things I don't even necessarily agree with? 
Not at all. And that's actually one of the powers, I think, of wonder is that we, I think as humans, we become a bit obsessed with happiness. And I've had some people say, oh, you hate happiness, but I'm not the Grinch that stole happiness, I promise. But I feel that we are so focused on always these positively valenced emotions, and it's just not a steady state, right? Our world is full of really difficult things. And the beauty of wonder is that we can experience difficult things hard things to discuss and and even disgust and still feel a sense of wonder in that. And in that, then I think we're able to better sort of metabolize what we're experiencing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and metabolize what we are experiencing. That's a very technical phrasing. That's a, something an applied scientist would say. Okay. So that's one of the powers. I mean, you list, you have, you talk about a lot of powers. <laughs> um, and I want, I, want, I want to go through some of the powers. What's a potential downside before I get to all the powers? Well, a potential downside. One of the things that I did research is potentially cults is a potential downside that if we become so in awe of a person, there is a degree of uh, plasticity that occurs. And certainly what gets planted in that, you know, that sort of fertile ground could be something positive or negative. Um, so I think that that could be a potential negative. But other than that, it, I think that it's just a, an opportunity for us to see the world through through a different lens and through a lens that I think is more sustainable and more resilient than a lot of the positive thinking movement that is very focused on just happiness. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you distinguish these things. Um, is wonder always an emotion? I mean, I think it's interesting that you have in the side pedal, the extraordinary emotion. You could have easily have said the extraordinary cognition and emotion interaction. <laughs> you know, you could have, yeah. you know, that wouldn't be a sexy. No, um, I was going to say, you know how books are written. We don't usually get to ch uh, pick our, our titles, but I, I actually, when I describe it, I call it an emotional experience. So, you know, it starts with openness to experience, which is not an emotion. It's, it's a, a personality trait moves into curiosity, which is the two wonder that we would have. That's sort of the, the sense of curiosity, the noun of, of wonder, then moving into absorption, which could be a state or a trait. And then, finishing with awe, which is what I see as sort of the noun of wonder, you experiencing a wonder. And I wanted to link all of those concepts together into one, I guess, almost a cycle of wonder, because each time we experience one of those components, we're more likely to experience them in the future. And it becomes this additive upward spiral that's very positive for us. Nice. I like that. It's very Barbara Fredrickson of you. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so what is the what what is the difference between the experience of wonder and the experience of awe? Are they the same thing? I see awe as a subset of wonder. So I see awe as sort of the um, the the wow and woe. The way I describe it is it's watch, wander, whittle, wow and woe. And the wow and woe, the, the big fireworks at the end of the wonder cycle. But one of the reasons why I didn't just research awe is because I wanted people to not feel that it was this rare and fleeting thing that sort of if we were lucky enough, we chanced upon it. I wanted people to recognize that there's a, a process. It's not just a about the destination, that there's this, you know, ramp that we take, a, a taking off into awe, and that that can have just as much value as the awe experience as well. And so each one of the components has its own benefit and beauty to it. And of course, awe being something that's tremendously impactful for us, but I see it as a subset of wonder. Now, where did you come up with these five elements? Did that, does that, you came up with that from your own head of wonder? Uh, it was when I started, I started researching wonder and trying to exactly what you say to parse apart. Well, what, yeah. what is wonder as opposed to awe? And what I found that spiritually, etymologically, that wonder was different from awe. And then I started considering, well, we have the verb to wonder. How do we link these two pieces? And what I kept coming back to is that openness to experience seems to be the foundation of all of this. And so starting understanding openness to experience that people 
people who are more open are more likely to experience these other elements. And then I just found that absorption seemed to be this connecting point. And I think you and I actually talked about that, that absorption could almost be a, a light flow state or a, a, a light uh, self-transcendental experience, as opposed to maybe it's just a, uh, some people say it's actually a t type of super deep curiosity. And so to me, that seemed to link those two concepts. And this is, this is my thesis, I guess, that I put forward. Uh, no, it, it, it does help make some finely grained distinctions that we don't often see in the, in the psychological literature. And like you said, each one of these five have their own sort of thing going on you know, <laughs> uh, over them. Um, is that guess, a scientific expression thing going on? Yeah, it is. It is. It yeah. Is. The, I'd say the only one that I don't, uh, that I need a little more clarification on is whittle. What, what was it? What, when I'm in a whittle state, what, what's going on? Is that a good thing? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's about pairing back. Uh, it's about pairing back extraneous noise. It's about becoming super hyper focused. If we think, if we consider awe, yes, we could be slapped across the face with something that's really awe inspiring. But if we're to find awe in the quotidian, then we need to do that by finding a certain degree of presence, right? We have to really be present in our environment. And if we're letting that chattering monkey mind go on and we're not paying attention, then we have the, we're going to miss potentially that, that awe experience. And so this is really about pairing back the attention that we tend to give to too much of things. Mm -hmm. And I like the, the description. I don't know if you're familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright, but he talks about this uh, design idea, which he calls compression and release which is that if you put people into a space that's very dark and compressed, and then you show them the differential of these big, beautiful rooms, that it makes it feel that much more impactful. And so I think that this is also a way of reminding us that our brain notices difference. And if we're able to get into a, a zone where we're very focused and present, then the awe experience will be, I think, more easily seen. Can you or noticed things? noticed yeah i mean are these these five elements they do they all interact with each other or is it like a hierarchy is it like you integ you integrate i wouldn't i think it, i see it as a cycle i see that it starts with that the openness to experience is the is the is the foundation and then moving into curiosity that if we have some kind of epistemic curiosity what i sort of call deep curiosity because of course there's so many different models of curiosity that I wanted to make it simple that there's sure. sort of shallow curiosity, which is like smelling the milk to know if it's gone off and then deep curiosity, which is just the exploration for the enjoyment of it. And then moving from that into sort of falling down a rabbit hole into something that's quite deep. And then I describe awe as having two pieces. That's the wow and woe, because of course it's the experience and then the accommodation of it. And I, I felt that that was sort of a, especially when they talk about that at the end of an awe experience, your, your brain is forever changed. I just thought like, you know, mind blown is the woe. So to me, I find it quite descriptive. They say in, you know, the hip, hypnotis, hip, hypnosis field, that you can't, no one can really be hypnotized against their will in a way. Like mo there's most of the people are, are really open to ex the experience of being hypnotized and then they become hypnotized. But is it possible to be closed minded and to suddenly uh, encounter something where you're like, whoa, you know, like can, can your mind be changed even if you are closed minded? Is there any hope for half of this country? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's absolutely hope. And the thing is, it, it, that's why the presence element is so important because it, if it's such a big shift from what you experience, what you expect to happen, you know, the expectation violation, which is the start of awe, then you will, you will be forced to notice it. But if you are rushing, if you already have your preconceived notions of what the single right answer is, then yeah, you may miss it. And one of some of the work of Kruglancy with the need for cognition as opposed to need for cognitive closure, that connects also to sort of this deep curiosity and to our likelihood of experiencing awe. And I love the work that he does that says, you know, people who are high in need for cognition are more tolerant. And that is something unlike openness to experience, which there's 
debates about whether you can change that or not being a personality trait. Some people I spoke to said absolutely not. And others said our brains are always changing. But need for cognition and need for cognitive closure are things we can practice. So we can become less cognitively closed and more open in that sense. And that becomes sort of an, uh, a mechanism to support some of the things that maybe we were born with or that were fixed by the time we're in our 20s. Today's podcast is sponsored by Unlikely Collaborators. Their mission is to untangle the stories that hold us back as individuals, communities, nations, and humanity at large. Using the Perception Box lens, they do this through storytelling, experiences, impact, investments, and scientific research. Today's conversation with Monica really illustrates the importance of expanding the walls of our Perception Box. The Perception Box is the invisible mental box that we all live inside, and it can seriously hinder our ability to understand one another and to understand ourselves. In this episode, Monica vividly describes the wonder cycle, with each cycle having its own benefits and beauty, offering an opportunity for discovery about ourselves and how we see the world. She points out that wonder is better than happiness. While happiness isn't sustainable all the time, we can cultivate a sense of wonder for our everyday moments both the light and dark of our lives. From a perception box perspective, expanding our perception box helps us enter a self-transcendent state of consciousness. When we are in a judgmental state of mind, we hold so many assumptions about ourselves and others, many which are very limiting. The act of engaging in curiosity itself can expand our perception box. And once your walls are expanded, you can increase your sense of wonder and compassion for others who may be even very different from yourself. Curiosity is the gateway to wonder because it leads to surprising new information about others and the world. Also, in order to have wonder for something, you have to pay close attention to it, and that often requires letting go of all the stories you've held about something. This letting go process expands your perception box and allows you to be more open to the wonder of everyday experience, just as Monica so brilliantly describes in this episode. To find out more about Unlikely Collaborators and the Perception Box, go to unlikelycollaborators.com. Seems like um, a lot of other personality traits have relevance here. Like, what about the neuroticism domain of personality or OCD? You know, Mm. like, um, it seems like uh, if you score very extremely high in those, they might be inhibitors of wonder. Absolutely. And I, what I think is really interesting is to see the work that's being done, obviously, with psychedelics and people with OCD that, that potentially the awe experience can short circuit that rumination. But absolutely, what we're trying to get away from is the ruminative mind and that chattering monkey mind and more into something that is absorbed. And even we've talked about it, daydreaming, but the positive type of daydreaming, not the ruminative sort. Yes, that's, I've spent my career looking at that. I know. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about the wander part. Not all minds that wander are lost. Is that correct? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, the, this is the curiosity element, the, the verb of to wonder. And I find it particularly exciting because there, I know that there's a habit that we have that we think we're being curious when we're sort of scrolling through our phones or that hopping from one idea to another. But I am hoping that people will start to see the benefit in that deep curiosity in curiosity that has meaning that is for the enjoyment of exploration. And that that again is a muscle that we can, we can flex that we can learn over time to, to use. And I love some of the more recent research showing that curiosity may be the, the difference between whether we experience post-traumatic stress as opposed to post-traumatic growth. I saw some work, uh, I think it was Cashden that said that. And I think that it's really interesting as we start to unfold what curiosity can be for us, other than just something that frankly was, you know, a lot of people see it or used to see it as a negative, right? Curiosity killed the cat. And so recognizing the, the, the benefit of deep curiosity and for the exploration of it. Well, close-minded people think curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> curious yes. people are curious what killed the cat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and curiosity is at its heart. It's it's the I guess the the foundation of empathy as well, right? We know that if you are empathetic, it's it's really about being genuinely curious about another human being. And 
I also find the interpersonal elements of curiosity particularly fascinating. The research that shows that if you ask someone questions about themselves that are genuinely curious, that person will find you more attractive, which is a great, a great tip for anybody who's dating in the world, you know, to be genuinely curious. And I think that that, that interpersonal element, doctors uh, perform better when they're genuinely curious about their patients. And so this interpersonal element of, of, of curiosity to me is very exciting as well. Yeah, I'm super interested in that as well. I want to not gloss over this PTSD versus post-traumatic growth distinction you make. It's a very important one. Um, you can also be experiencing PTSD at the same time that you are experiencing mm. post-traumatic growth. They're not uh, either or situations. Um, but can you go more into what people who are suffering from uh, ruminative uh, trauma, um, how, you know, how can some of, how can wonder help them? Can you be more explicit about that? Yeah. Well, what, what, what I have, you're more the expert in this probably than I am, but what I've discovered is that it's really about being able to, to some degree. And, and I know that we've talked about the, the default mode network and that sometimes it gets a little bit blamed for some things. It's not always bad, but it's about being able to start to, um, to short circuit that in a positive way. So that's the rumination. Also, there was some research done around the, the, the there's a hippocampal uh, role in people who experience post-traumatic stress and that wonder does trigger the hippocampus and certainly curiosity does as well. So there might be some way that it's, it's increasing the strength of the hippocampus in some way that, that al allows people to be more resilient. Um, it was a twin study that, yeah, showed that small, those with the smaller hippocampus were more likely to experience post-traumatic stress. So I, I think that there's a lot of different ways that it can connect in, but obviously that's still being explored. And as not being a researcher, I I'm, I'm just sort of like a gannet, just collecting all the different little bits that I can and, and seeing the picture that it creates. Yeah, but you're very curious about the research literature. And you're, 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 you're I'm a, a nerd. <laughs> I, yeah, love I, I love it. I love it. You were really citing a lot of the literature. And I love scientists. I love what you all do. And I think it's so exciting. And I love seeing that, that sense of exploration that scientists make their entire living over. Me too. Uh, I, I love when people blame things on their brain areas. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> my small hippocampus made me do it. You know, like, we could uh, start at a certain level. We can blame everything on. I think the symptoms is like bad brain, some, bad brain, some brain area. Yeah, if we want to find something, you know, we every time we don't eat, we can be uh, every time. Every time we, we we eat something we know we're not supposed to, uh, we can blame our prefrontal cortex. If we want. There you go. You know, Everyone, I feel like we live in a society right now where everyone likes blaming everyone else for their problems and uh, people are not really taking responsibility for themselves. Even blaming a brain area is not really taking responsibility. <laughs> it's still I, blaming something else, even though it's part of you. I agree. And I think that it's making people very fragile. And one of the things that I, I do love about the benefit of wonder is I think that it makes us stronger. I think it allows us to be more resilient. It pushes us forward rather than retreating, right? We, we are, when we're in a wonder state, we're desirous of, of, of moving ourselves forward either into new experiences or new ideas or to new people. And that, I think is is just contrary to to fragility, to judgment, to intolerance. So you know, maybe I'm being a Pollyanna, but I'd love to think that if we had a more wonder prone society, we would meet each other with greater tolerance, with more openness, with more curiosity, with more empathy, and that it would create a more tolerant world. Wouldn't that be nice? Amazing. How does wonder like shift our perceptions you know of of uh of reality and um maybe even shift what's possible in our lives you know I mean, mm. isn't it po you know we, we often get these these blinders on or as my you know uh yeah we get these blinders and uh we get stuck in these in our perception boxes as my friend calls it yeah so like what what how can we get out of it <laughs> 
I think that it, it allows us to start connecting the dots in ways that maybe we hadn't before. And of course, if we want to throw in psychedelics in the mix, I mean, that certainly can be a, a, a mechanism for changing the way that we see the world. But I don't think that we all just have to go and take mushrooms in order to have that experience. I think that um, we can experience it through big wonder ex moments. We can experience it through deep meditation, which is sort of slow thought that helps us get us closer to wonder. But to me, it's just about being to actually looking at our world as opposed to assuming what we think we're going to see. And that is one of the challenges is that we're always so busy, always moving forward, always believing we know what the next thing will be, that we miss so many opportunities for just amazing, mind blowing wonder. And yet we just rush right by it. You know, the perfect autumn leaf or a, a, a beautiful strain of music or even just a, the way that you look into somebody else's eyes. But we're just in such a hurry that we're missing so much of it. Wow. Or whoa. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> whoa, is, whoa is deeper than wow in your five part model. It's, it's, wow. the la it's the last. It's the last bit. Yep. Yeah. Whoa. psilocybin wow <laughs> marijuana <laughs> interesting could yeah. be yeah interesting I, I, that, was a, that was a good point scott that was a good <laughs> point hey everyone i'd like to take a moment to talk about one of my favorite products that helps me big time with my gut health you might wonder why the psychology podcast would care about gut health mental health and gut health are unrelated right well actually mental health and gut health are very highly related it's so interesting, actually. Your gut has hundreds of millions of neurons, just like your brain, and the gut forms a two-way communication pathway with the brain known as the gut-brain axis. So in addition to limiting bloating and optimizing digestion, add mental wellness to the list of reasons you should optimize your gut health. Qualia Symbiotic is a great and easy way to optimize your gut health every day. Qualia Symbiotic packs 28 of the most research-backed prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics into a simple scoop you add to a glass of water for extremely complete gut support in just seconds a day. It even has psychobiotics in the blend, which are a specific type of probiotic ideal for supporting brain health and mental wellness. And it has spore form probiotics, which are more bioavailable than most probiotics on the market. It covers all the bases of gut support in an all-in-one scoop that doesn't even need refrigeration. This is the easiest and most complete gut support blend on the market, made by Neurohacker Collective, a company I really trust. I've known the folks at Neurohacker Collective for years now, and they are really thoughtful about what they put into their products, always trying to be as science-informed as possible. To try Qualia Symbiotic for up to 50% off, go to neurohacker.com and use Psych Podcast for an additional 15% off. For gut health support that covers all the bases, including brain health support, try Qualia Symbiotic with code PSYCHPODCAST at neurohacker.com slash PSYCHPODCAST. Can you explain the concept of slow thought for me? Because that seems related to what you were just saying about kind of having a little more patience and right is that linked a little bit? yeah absolutely okay. i i use that thank goodness that i use awkward. it to describe anything that helps us slow down so it's going to be something that definitely helps us create a presence practice that gives us a greater degree of attentional control so again meditation being one of those ways that we can do it narrative journaling nostalgia i think is even a fascinating way just reflecting daydreaming could be a slow thought practice positive constructive daydreaming not the ruminative kind uh, gratitude practice or prayer anything that allows us to create that sort of small self and to explore our inner workings in our inner world in a way that is very present in our external world rather than moving through an autopilot, which we do so much of. And also I think that our technology doesn't necessarily help. I think that we have corporate cultures that are very much about move fast and break things. And there's not a lot of time or respect given to slowing down. And I would love to see, you know, there's a slow food movement, there's slow, slow teaching, slow sex. And I think that there can be slow thought and that it can really help us connect to, um, to our inner workings and our, our inner being. Wow. Yeah, you, you do cover such a wide range of, of examples in your book, which is something I really like. 
about it and, and, and probably only something you can bring to the table. I mean, this is why you're uniquely poised to write such a book. Yeah, uh, you know, you cover it from architecture and, um, which I've definitely experienced, uh, mm. whoa, you know, for lots of architecture, um, the, lo the love experience for sure. Sex, you just talked a little about slow sex. Yeah. Double click on that in a second. Sleep. What does whoa sleep look like? Like, is that like when you really feel rest rested? <laughs> Well, I spoke to a couple of different sleep scientists, um, and what they told me was that it's really about sleep being the, the precursor to being able to have that attentional control, because we know that if we are sleep deprived, then our brains are using just the bare minimum of resources to just get through the day. And it's certainly not going to take the time to notice what's going on around us. It's not going to want to slow down. And so it's about having that be part of the slow thought practice in order to be able to find the ability and the desire to have attentional control. Wow. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's so true that when you have not slept well, you it makes it much harder to inhibit your ruminations that we all have. And I'm an insomniac. I, I know it. It's it's terrible. I can understand why it's a form of torture, right? To deprive people of sleep. Yeah. It is absolutely terrible. Uh, what about in situations in your life, you know, not just sleep, but what about situations in your life in general where you're in a very fast paced environment? How can you use wonder to maybe slow down your brain even in a very fast paced environment. You know, let's say you're in a football field and you can't just tell everyone, hold up <laughs> if oh. you're the quarterback. You know, like I need to have some more time to get into my wonder state. I think that that's probably where you start thinking about a wonder mindset. So it's not uh -oh. about doing it in that moment, but it's about becoming so adept at 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 utilizing the tools that help you get closer to wonder that then when you're in this moment that is um, very fraught with energy that you can still tap into it a little bit like you see these people who are um, master yogis and who can dial it up at any time. It's about the, and I see it, I really do see it as a practice that the more that we seek to find it, the more we recognize it, the more that we write about it, the more that we share it, wonder shared is wonder multiplied, that then we become more adept at being able to draw it down in the times that we, we need it, even if it's in a chaotic environment. So it's really a, a resource available to us anytime. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. We just need to be willing to find it and then to to hone the skills in, in identifying things that make us feel wonder and to be able to see it in just the quotidian in our day to day life and in terrible times, you know, to be able to see it when you're watching about the war in Ukraine or to see it when we see these terrible earthquakes that there's still wonder there because I think that the negative news cycle definitely wants to to kill our empathy it wants to kill our our awareness it almost wants to stunt our our recognition of humanity and i think that wonder is a, a way to 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 still stay connected to that and it, it deal with an emergency it's interesting because i did speak to um uh a gentleman who deals with people who come back from crisis situations. So things like plane crashes or um, being a uh, castaway. Uh, he actually works with people who are um, kidnapped um, and held hostage and then released in order to help them reintegrate. And what he found is that people who are able to find wonder, even in these terrible situations, that then because of that, it gives them a clarity that allows them to, um, to to problem solve, to be more aware. And I, I spoke to a gentleman, Stephen Callahan, who uh, was adrift for something like 80 days. And um, he wrote a very famous book about it. And he said that he was certain that the sense of wonder he felt from the beauty in the environment that he was in helped him have the alacrity to be able to survive in an environment where if he had been it sort of terror struck all the time that he wouldn't have been able to to see the answers that existed in his sphere. Oh wow! And so, I, have you used the phrase "wonder struck"? Mm, yes, and he did. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and he uses it. Nice, nice. 
Nice. So, so you, you, if you're if you're flying an airplane and it's going down, you know, and uh, you're about twenty seconds away from dying, <laughs> you, can still, you can still harness the power of wonder. I I, I don't I don't want to give anybody uh, any uh, any bad advice. I think that's where probably the checklist manifesto comes in helpful. But I think if we're looking at something that's more long term, okay. That and some of this, there is some really interesting research around the the people that are able to manage in the first few weeks of a crisis, and a lot of that has to do also with having a sense of purpose. And I see purpose and meaning being very connected to wonder, to these wonder elements. Epistemic curiosity being about meaningful curiosity, awe, tending to have some sort of purpose to it. So I think that there is there's something there about being able to find a purpose quickly and that that also helps buoy us. What did Steve Jobs say on his deathbed? Do you remember? I don't. It was, oh, wow, wow, wow. There you go. And people think maybe he was seeing something. Probably. Absolutely. But he was, uh, you know, uh, he was always kind of, I think open to experience mm. he was someone who was uh, my my recollection was that he was a master meditator he was someone that was very connected and i love i love william james's description of the filmiest of screens and that's really i think what wonder helps us do is that it allows us to at different times just sort of peel back that veil and see what is on the other side and I enjoy talking to scientists and asking them, well, what do you think is on the other side? And most of them said, that's just not something that science can answer. And so part of why I enjoyed this, and, and I was actually told by some of the scientists, you're released from being able to, to, to be able to have the conversation about the soul of this topic, as opposed to just the science. Um, and I think that that's where you move from science to soul is when you part that, that filmiest of, of screens and probably what Jobs was, was experiencing, sort of that transition and seeing what's on the other side. I think a lot of people transfer from soul to science when they enter grad school. I <laughs> 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 just had to, had to just talk about how soulless grad school is. Okay. But anyway, uh, what is, what are wonder bringers and how do we find them? Yeah, so wonder bringers are, I mean, a great way to know if you're in the presence of a wonder bringer is if it gives you goosebumps. That can certainly be an indication of, I know, I did, I mean, I, I write about Hello. it that sex, sex can be a wonder. Hello. There is, there are types of sex that can be wonder bringing, tends to be in a committed relationship, tends to be very deep. Um, but you can have, that can be one of the wonder bringers. Why I want people, I see that exploring what your wonder bringers are as something that is a real self exploration and a way to start to understand what it is that, that gets you excited, what makes you feel alive. And I wish that it could sort almost become a language that we use, sort of like a love language in a sense to say to people that that's my wonder bringer. If, if music is your wonder bringer, it's not just about a hobby. If hiking is your wonder bringer, it's fundamental to who you are as a human and you have to have it in order to have an enriched life. And so the more that we can start to understand, do they occur in nature? Are they cognitive? Like I'm a nerd. I love almost all of my wonder bringers are very cognitive in nature or in you know in the in the type that they are and is it or is it interpersonal is it with other people and starting to have that conversation with yourself about what gives you that sense of wonder i think could be really powerful for our own understanding of ourselves yeah yeah it very much can be I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self actualization coaching intensive while the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, 
an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org. I look forward to welcoming you in December. How can we teach this in schools? I think that um, I'm actually working with some educators to create a, um, a teacher's guide that is a, nice. that's a, associated with the book. Um, and hopefully that will come out towards the end of the year. Wonder is such an amazing mechanism for, for teaching and learning. We know, we talked about the hippocampus, that if something gives you, if it really surprises you, um, if it gives you a sense of that, that deep curiosity or even the wow, then it will embed in your long-term memory. But I also believe that teachers who teach from a place of wonder are able to impart that enthusiasm and that genuine curiosity to the children that they're teaching. And my concern is that we are teaching children in schools to the single right answer. So everything is very codified and there, and I understand teaching is complicated, that this is how, uh, I guess the, the systems are set up, but you look at the benefits of say a Montessori, and then you get kids into middle school, high school, and it's so regimented. And I believe that teaching kids that there's a single right answer in school, they grow up to be adults that believe there's a single right answer. And so I think that having schools that are not wonder-based enough, we're developing children who are higher in that need for cognitive closure and not as high in this need for cognition. They don't enjoy the exploration because they're not given the chance to. And so they grow up to be adults that think that everything has a single right answer. And when they find it, that gives them comfort. And I believe that actually taking wonder out of our schools is creating a more intolerant populace, but that's just a theory. Taking it out of the schools. It was never in the schools. Some schools, I think oh. some schools have it. I think you look at Montessori when you're, when you're little, you I know, see. you're allowed to play. Um, but then it's, then it's removed as we get older. And I was lucky. I had some teachers who were very wonder based and I still remember the, the lessons that they had, but it ends up being very, very individual to the teacher that you have. And I would love to see more teaching and learning using wonder as a mechanism for, for long-term learning and for lifelong learning. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I ever felt a, a sense of wonder taking the SATs. No, no. Standardization is not going to, is not going to help us. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate that that's, that's what has been created with education. And then you get into master's degrees and PhDs. Um, I spoke to one gentleman that said that, um, that MBAs in particular that were creating basically psychopaths. Um, so yeah, I, I, my hope is that it becomes just a, a, we're allowed more freewheeling exploration, more play, and that we don't see that as contrary to learning. Or is it, is the causality there that psychopaths are attracted to getting an MBA? Could be. Hmm. But of course, there's a play. lot of, but there's a lot of competition. I think that's the other challenge as well is that um, children are learning a sense of competition as opposed to um, collaboration so young. You know, they're being told you, you sit in this, you know, this pecking order in your intelligence or your performance. And I think when we start to do that, then they become, I guess, effectuated to this idea that this is how we have to behave. We become, we have to rank ourselves with other people. And that's just on steroids in an MBA program. Not, I'm not dissing MBAs, but you do see that. There's a lot of competition, which I don't think is necessarily I healthy. I got, it. yeah, I'm not dissing psychopaths either. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <Yeah. laughs> no offense to MBAs or psychopaths. We're just uh, stating some facts. No. Um, okay. So, Oh, daydreaming in schools. I've argued for many years that we need more, we need daydreaming time in schools. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And that, what was that article? It was something like a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. That just did, that set any kind of daydreaming um, science back so much because people said, see, no, it was terrible. And they said, see, we knew daydreaming was bad for you. 
absolutely don't believe that. It's good. And you and I have had this conversation. It's good for our brain to, to construct future scenarios for us to play out different activities in our mind. And I think that absolutely children need that daydreaming time, even better if that daydreaming time is, you know, in nature or an environment that is, um, that's very free cognitively. But again, it's recognizing the different types of daydreaming. We don't want that rumination. We don't want it to be so distracting that we're not able to get things done. But that positive, constructive daydreaming, I don't mm. see how that can't be good for especially a developing brain. Yeah. And that, that's not, they weren't referring to positive, constructive daydreaming. They were speaking about mind wandering, which uh, specifically is scientifically defined as getting off track you know when you're uh, have a when you have a goal you know how many times does your mind wander wander away from the goal but it's also a very goal directed way of thinking <laughs> and uh, yes and is maybe there's a reason it's wandering because there's something that yeah. perhaps your brain would find more, more intriguing yes 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 or wonderful there you go have you ever thought about that have you ever thought that about wonder that wonderful full yes um, and wonder filled, which apparently is also uh, the strap line for Oreos. So I couldn't use that one quite so much. I know. Interesting. Interesting. I've been eating gluten free Oreos lately. Ooh, and what's that good. like? Oh, pretty okay. All you know, right. I get no money for saying that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, what are some other things you want readers to take away from your wonder filled book? I think the key element for me is that it's this idea that there's more, that what we see in our day-to-day -day life, what we're rushing through is, it's just really a fraction of what there is to experience either in this reality or another one. And the way that I describe it, it's sort of like a, a tapping heard through the wall. I think we all know that there is something else there, but there are all these reasons why we block ourselves from trying to explore it. And I think that wonder is the potentially the key to the that door. And certainly when you get into psychedelics, that can be, yes, kicking the door down, we'll say. But I, that's the key thing that I'd like people to take away is that there's more. And I do believe that if we meet each other with openness, with curiosity, with presence, that we will be a more tolerant world. And that is something that I, I don't think I'm a Pollyanna. That's just something I'd like to see. Oh, I love that. You, you really think that if we cult if each of us went through lots the practices in your book individually, that collectively we'd be a better society? I do believe that. Now I'm not, I'm, I'm not thinking that, yes, that if somebody is a horrible human being, that they're fractured, that they're a terrorist, that somehow doing a wonder practice will fix them. I, I, I don't believe that, but I think that the average person can really benefit from that and it will create more pro-social behaviors that connect us to one another rather than behaviors that push other people away. And in that is tolerance. Gotcha. Um, tolerance, you know, tolerance and even to maybe even just love, love as well. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, always, everyone is uh, like stops at tolerance. Like that's good enough. <laughs> that's I just tolerate like, you. Could we just have that? I'd, I'd be happy with that. You'd be at happy this point. with just that right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. So to help people, uh, you know, they're feeling inspired. They're listening to you in this episode and they want to do something T teach them how to take a daily wonder walk. Absolutely. So a wonder walk, great if you can do it outside. Our brain notices newness. So we love novelty. If it can be a different route that you... What? Newness, things that are new. Nudis. <laughs> Nudis. That would be very new. That, okay. that would Wait, be very new. Focus. No, that's not what you said. Okay, go on. It's not. But you, you could take a, you could take a tr uh, walk towards nudist, but it, it, we notice newness. So something that has some element of novelty in it. Um, an element that allows us to either see something that's big, like the sea or a, um, a mountain. But if you can't go big, then go small to notice the little details that you might have missed otherwise. And I find that at the end of a wonder walk, if you just do a little bit of journaling, I know people aren't wild about journaling, but it really does help your brain hold on to the experience. If you just do a little bit of writing and leave the phone, you've got to leave the phone because that's just going to take you away from the experience 
experience of your wonder walk and and just yeah you'll lose the opportunity i love the research that um i i think it was keltner but it was certainly about awe that they t set people on walks and um one on a regular walk and one on an awe walk and the people that came back from the awe walk even just had bigger smiles in their selfies so i think that that says it all um so just a, a new route something where you're not distracted and if you can't go big go small this episode gave me a big smile oh <laughs> thanks scott yeah me too i feel more oh good I'm glad to hear that <laughs> um so you think we all can do things even just maybe simple things in our day to become more wonder prone mm. yeah do you think that yeah doing this will give us a greater sense of magic for the world? Oh, goodness, I certainly hope so. And I, I don't see how it can't, because you're going to start to see things in a way that you hadn't before, you will recognize that actually, you believe that you have everything so figured out, but in fact, you don't. And there is so much magic that we just move through. I mean, even for me, uh, flying, I fly so much for work, but every time that plane takes off, I am just blown away. It's the most miraculous, magical thing. I am in the air in a metal tube. It's incredible. But we just stop seeing the magic that's around us. And I, I guess that's one of the things that I hope people will start to do is to see the magic, to marinate in the magic, and to allow yourself to be changed by the magic. Yes, changed, you know, from a state of fear and anxiety to wonder, you know, if maybe of a fear of flying maybe shifting that a little more to um, the curiosity the, of the it curiosity. and the magic. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for a magical podcast chat and congratulations again on uh, the publication of your book. It's no easy feat writing a book, uh, but then writing a book on wonder, you know, <laughs> trying to, to have the magic jump out of the pages is no easy feat either. Um, but you succeeded uh, and yeah, congratulations. Thanks for, thanks for finally being on my show. Thank you so much, Scott. It was awesome. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.